All right, welcome everyone to the last session of the meeting. Thanks for staying to the bitter end. Um, I'm going to introduce my co-chair. Uh, my name is Susan Landau and my co-chair is Suzanne Hendricks. And her talk is uh, results of a phase two randomized withdrawal study of simufilum in mild to moderate Alzheimer's. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm uh, grateful to the organizers for inviting this. And I will be talking about the randomized withdrawal study. As many of you know, I'm a statistician. So if you have statistical questions, I'm totally the right one. If you're different questions, ask somebody else. <laughs> okay, this shows the author list and disclosures and then forward-looking statements. So the mechanism of action is altered fillin A, yeah, I knew I was gonna say it wrong, enables A beta 42 signaling with two different receptors and simifilam binds altered FNLA and FLNA and then disrupts that and disrupts it on both of those pathways. This shows how that happens and you guys will understand this, I'm sure many of you much more than I will. And then this shows where it binds and disrupts the linkage and then stops the A-beta-42 signaling and then downstream tau hypophosphorylation. Um, this also shows the second receptor that it links to and then it binds it again, disrupts the linkage and then stops A-beta-42 induced neuroinflammation. So it's two separate pathways that both work in a similar mechanism. The randomized withdrawal study design that we did was an open, originally there was an open label study that was 12 months and everyone was on active treatment. After that, they were randomized to either six months of simiflam continuing or six months of placebo. And the idea is that if the treatment worked, um, then the group who's taken off of treatment will lose some of the benefit and the group that remains on will continue to maintain that benefit. It's a little tricky though because sometimes there are carryover effects and with six months off treatment, you don't know how long you need to be able to lose those carryover effects. There will then also be an open label study afterward that's six months and so we'll be able to see if people who go off and then come back on lose some effect and then get some effect back when they go back on. This shows the safety um, the number of occurrences within the open label study. And of course, there's no placebo group here, so you can't really compare to anything directly. This shows the events once we're in the randomized withdrawal phase. And you can see that um, the N is very well balanced between the two groups. And the number of events of each of these types is similar between active and placebo. This shows what the baseline characteristics are for the open label period. So this was the beginning of the study and they're um, mild and moderate subgroups. And then, and one of the things to notice here is that the MMSE min and max are 20, let's see, the moderate group is 10 to 20 and the mild group is 21 to 30. So 47% of the patients improved on the ADAS cog over the full 12 month period. And then an additional 23% declined by less than five points, meaning that they declined, but not as fast as you might expect and that group had a mean decline of 2.5 points. Mild patients improved over the 12 months by um, 0.73 points of improvement. The moderates declined with 4.11 points. And we analyzed this against some historic data sets that we have. What we did is we took the placebo groups from all of the studies shown here. And of course, we, we used the solanizumab study because it had mild to moderate patients. So we took the placebo groups from all of these studies and we show mild to moderate from expedition one and two, and then one and two together because they were published together also. And then we have the Thomas data that shows um, a combination of several of the ADCS studies. And then um, also compared to the Cortexime data placebo group there. And then at the very bottom is the, um, is the treatment effect with simifilam from the open label study. So essentially what this is showing is that the pattern of decline that was seen in the mild to moderate treatment arm was a lot less decline than you would normally see with a placebo group of similar populations. So whichever placebo group you used, there was quite a bit more decline than was seen in that um, active arm in the open label. This shows what happens with the um, historical data in early or mild AD. So within the open label study, this is the mild patients only at the very bottom there with the improvement that we noted on the earlier slide. And then over on the right shows all these different groups with either early AD, all of the monoclonal antibody placebo groups, and then with mild AD, all of the different groups with mild 
separated out from the mild to moderate studies in most cases. And again, what you see is that it's very rare to see improvement um, in a mild group for 12 months. And in fact, the averages are usually quite a bit lower than that. And the confidence interval around that group at the bottom with the active semiphalam group um, just barely overlaps with the mildest of the placebo arms from those mild and early AD studies. And, and those data that we combined it with was, these are data sets that we've used for a long time and we've used that historic data to compare for lots of other treatments as well. So we just put simifulam into the same figure we already make all the time. So this now shows the baseline demographics for the randomized withdrawal period. So at the beginning of that phase, this is what the patients look like. This one now shows the baseline characteristics also at the beginning of the randomized withdrawal phase. And what you can see is for the MMSE range at the bottom, we're now down to five to 20 for the placebo arm and four to 20 for the semifilam arm. And so many of those patients have worsened quite substantially and there are actually some moderate patients and some low uh, or some severe patients and then also some low moderate patients as well. This shows overall in the full analysis set what happens in the randomized withdrawal phase. So this is rebaselining at the beginning of the six month randomized withdrawal phase and then showing the separation of semiflam and placebo. So it's a 38% slowing of decline with those two groups, meaning that the placebo group loses the effect that they had with semiflam, continues progressing at more or less an expected rate um, with no treatment, and then the semiflam group is progressing at a slower rate by 38%. This figure shows active, the full active group with both mild and moderate patients included. And now we show separated out. So within the mild AD patients, and this is the mild AD group defined by the beginning of the randomized withdrawal phase. So the second phase of the study at the time of randomization, the people who were still MMSC of 21 and above. And what you see is an improvement in the treated patients and worsening um, in the active, or sorry, in the placebo arm. It shows a 205% slowing of decline, which is a little weird, but what it means is that the active arm improved by as much as the placebo group declined. And the placebo decline in these mild subjects is close to what would be expected based on historic data. Maybe a little less. But again, we may have carryover effects too. So this then is showing the numbers for this. So the full analysis set, which is included in all of the patients, is not statistically different. And you could see that those um, error bars were overlapping. P-value is 0.476. I need to remind people sometimes that um, it's a two-sided P-value. So what that means is that, um, that half of that p-value, 0.24, is uh, half of that p-value would be the percentile that you would be in. So this says that those results are within the top quarter of results that you might see. Um, then the next one shows mild AD patients alone, and it's a two-sided p-value of 0.136. And then the moderate AD patients alone, 0.912. So you can tell that the moderate patients weren't really showing much separation. And again, many of those moderate patients were actually even severe by the time they um, were randomized off or stayed on treatment. This shows all four of the groups from the very beginning all the way through. This figure does not re-baseline people because everyone, as they went into the randomized withdrawal, we just followed them all the way from the beginning. So the mild and moderates here are defined at the very beginning of the baseline and then followed all the way throughout the open label phase and then also through the randomized withdrawal. Now what you can see is at the time of the randomized withdrawal, so, so sorry, all four lines, all four groups are on treatment all the way up to that dashed line. And at the point of the dashed line, half of the patients go off. The lower of the two lines in the top group was the group going down, that's the mild subgroup coming off of treatment, going on to placebo. And within the bottom, the orange versus the yellow is the, um, is the moderate group staying on treatment or coming off of treatment. So you can see that there is separation between the groups once they come off of treatment. Um, but those two within the mild and moderate are fairly similar to each other and not statistically different. So this now shows the mild versus 18 month early AD historic declines. And what this is doing is it's saying, is there a difference in groups that were on treatment for 12 months and then either on or off treatment for the last six months? And those are the two bottom lines. So the top of those two bottom lines is on treatment the entire 18 months. 
the bottom one is on treatment for 12 months, and then off for six months. And then the historic control groups that are comparable are shown up on the top with the four little lines with error bars. So again, the decline that we're seeing is substantially less than you would normally expect based on comparison to these historic control arms. So the summary is that or oral semaphalam 100 mg is safe and well tolerated. It showed slowed cognitive decline by 38% at six months versus placebo. So we did see more decline in the people who came off of treatment than in the ones that stayed on. Um, it does appear to favor treatments with mild AD. Um, patients with mild AD, it slowed cognitive decline by more, um, but again, not statistically significant, p-value of 0.14, um, and the end by that time is lower. The analysis we did was an MMRM from the very beginning to the end, and then a second MMRM within just the randomized phase, and so it does correct for the dropouts to account for whether there were differential dropouts in the groups. In patients with mild AD, semaphalam stabled ADAS COG scores over 18 months, and based on the comparison to the historic data, you can tell that that's pretty unusual to have that much stabilization over that long of a time period. Next steps, um, this treatment is under evaluation in two global pivotal phase three trials, both of which are just completing enrollment. One already did, one will complete next week. Um, and 60 to 70% of the patients entered the phase three with mild AD, so it's 21 to 27, so more of them will be mild than moderate. Both of them received an SPA from the FDA, and the enrollment um, is just finishing up now. So if you have any questions, and again, please lean toward the statistical questions, mechanistic questions, I won't be much help. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Looks like there's a question back there. Yeah, could you explain the rationale for running a randomized withdrawal study in this patient population? And what was the, what was, when I think about that, you know, it's a, an enriched patient population, you know, you got responders and then you're looking at the randomized portion, you're looking at usually duration of treatment. What, what, can you explain the rationale and then what was the definition of response at that, at the randomization period? Yeah, yeah, really good question. So normally a uh, randomized withdrawal, the point is to take responders and say, how long does it take for that response to go away? And in this case, it was actually a different rationale. The original study had been an open label study. And at the end of the study, they realized we don't really know if it worked because we didn't have a placebo arm. We can see that the decline is really small. We can compare to historic groups, but a placebo arm would really help confirm these results. What's an easy way we can add something on that would give us the additional information of comparing against placebo? And so the thought was, well, we can do a randomized withdrawal to see if upon withdrawal, there's some loss of an effect, which would imply the effect must have been real once you compare to a placebo. And so that's kind of a different way to do it. And and because of that, they didn't actually exclude anyone in terms of who was allowed to go into the randomized withdrawal phase. So anyone who completed the first 12 months of randomized or of the open label study was allowed to go into the randomized withdrawal. So it's not actually a responder subgroup. It's everyone who completed. They're all allowed to be in it. And then we just see, was there some loss of effect when people come off of treatment? So it's a little bit unusual, but it, it does address the question of, if we had a placebo group, what would we be able to see? But it still leaves some unanswered questions because it's not a randomized placebo from the beginning, which of course the next two studies will be able to address. And it's also still this question of how long does the treatment continue to benefit you once you come off? And are those placebo patients actually declining at a normal rate? And when we show the comparison to placebo across 18 months, you can tell they're not back to where a placebo group would have been if they hadn't received treatment the whole time. So they're still, you know, maintaining benefit from the treatment they received. Go ahead. Um, first, Suzanne, thank you for a very, very nice, very clear presentation. Um, were, remind me, were patients on background therapy, cholinesterase inhibitors, and or memantine at entry, and then were they allowed to go on to those uh, therapies during, during the study? So they were on them at the beginning, and someone needs to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some people went on, but they were encouraged not to start them, but if they needed to take them, they could. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong? Okay, that was correct. <laughs> do you know the percentages of patients, how, how many were? What percentage started them? Versus, oh, how many were treatment naive? Um, I would assume it would be kind of the normal rates in the population, which would be 70 to 80-ish percent of people would be on background cholinesterase or memantine. Is that about right too, Lindsay? 
Okay, I can check on that if you'd like. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you, you for your attention. Our next speaker is 